Okay, so I'm going to talk uh, about another large, very large policy reforms of about land rights, and that was in Mexico. And, oh, sorry. And this is I'm going to report on several papers and several piece of work that we've done together with Alain de Janvry, who is here, Kyle Emerick, who is now at Tufts University, Marco Gonzalez Navarro at UC Berkeley with us, also, and Daly Kuzman, who is now at Northwestern. So I'm picking up on several papers and studies that we have done. The motivation for most of these studies were that for the property rights reform come from that conventional wisdom, right or wrong, but that, that uh, we need sufficiently complete property rights uh, for development. This is very important for development. So I'm using ex uh, expressively sufficiently complete, complete property rights, not necessarily full property rights, but at least security and no arbitrariness in the property rights reallocation and the change. There's also that idea that land reform, which would provide to small landowners that sort of property rights sufficiently secure, can be the source of agricultural growth, at least in that sector, and poverty reduction. And yet, and Alain just mentioned that uh, in the introduction, most land reform that we've seen throughout the world have given uh, excessively incomplete property rights. And then not only incomplete, but very insecure in terms of, not only on, with restriction, but very insecure in terms of whether the, the, the rules can change over time, whether there's arbitrariness throughout the process. Now, in the case of Mexico, we have just observed a huge, relatively recent land reform, which gives us an opportunity to see how a major change and increase in security of property rights uh, has, has, has some effect. So we're going to present, I'm going to present to you uh, the result of uh, three studies that we did on the impact of that Mexican uh, property rights reform. Very briefly, I'm going to recall uh, the experience of Mexico for that land reform, talk a little bit about the empirical strategy that we use in all these studies, it's the same and the data that we have, and then look at three issues, land reallocation, sorry, labor reallocation and migration, something on land use, and finally some political consequences of the land reform. So uh, briefly about the a reminder of what's been the experience of Mexico with land reform. The first land reform started pretty quickly after the revolution in Mexico, and then all the way to 1992. And it created it was a massive land reform, redistributive land reform, creating 32,000 new agrarian communities, which were called heridos or uh, indigenous communities in some cases. It's huge in the sense that it gave land to 3.5 million households, and it covered more than half of the, uh, the territory in Mexico. So this is at scale, which I think is really important to, be, to, to look at. Now, in these, those heridos, and I'm going to uh, focus on heridos more than the indigenous communities, which had different property rights. In the herido, there is, in addition to the housing plots, there's two types of uh, land. Uh, each household has uh, individual plots, which are agricultural plots, meant to be produ uh, for production, agricultural production, which, are held, which were held in use of fruct. And then pastures and forests, which represent a large share of the land which is held in the eridos, were held in common property. Now, the reform give uh, and Alain would say purposefully, I don't know, but the reform will give very incomplete property rights to the beneficiaries. And the idea was, I think it's been documented that, as an instrument of political control. On the individual plots, for example, which is the, 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 under the responsibility of the household, there was requirement that there would be direct cultivation. So you are not allowed to rent the land out, you know, not, not even, allowed to hire the workers. It has to be, and that was, they were relatively small plots, it has to be cultivated by the household and strictly by the household and no renting out. There was also requirement of continuous cultivation. If you let your land idle for more than two years, then it could be taken out uh, and a few get taken out and given to somebody else. Use it or lose it. 
And then the land could be only inherited by one child. And the benefit of that is that there was not that divisions to tiny little plot, but it also means that nobody could be incorporated in those, uh, in those eridos, which also created a lot of marginal people around the eridos as well. For the part which is in common property, uh, all the pastures, which are important, and the forest, there was no formal sharing or rules of sharing of the benefits. So in a way, uh, while some eridos were well managed and could have be real common property resources, in many cases we see over extensive over extraction, uh, and in many cases uh, something that looks very much like the tragedy of the common with encroachment and over extraction. The consequences of the first land reform, I think by many of the uh, political economy writers, is that it was very effective in terms of political control. The votes were delivered to the party bosses, and in particular, it's very easy to observe the votes of Eridos because they all vote in the same electoral section. So you get a very clear idea of what percentage of the Eridos uh, voted for you. And it helped the PRI, which is the party that uh, did the reform that did the first uh, reform, remained in power throughout that period until, two, until 2000. But seen from the economic point of view, I think this political, political control was achieved with a very high efficiency and welfare cost. There is clearly excessive labor in, in agriculture in Mexico. When you, look, uh, when you look at where Mexico is on the curve of the share of the population, which is in rural areas uh, relative to the, uh, the GDP per capita, Mexico is way above the overall average of the countries at that their level of, at the level of GDP per capita. There's a, a study by Melissa Dell a few years, a couple of years back, that shows that even now we can see that the municipalities which had more ADHIDOs relative to the others lagged in industrialization. And then we have documented that there is ex extensive poverty in the Hedo sector. So this is a high cost, uh, and that sort of led probably to the uh, second land reform. So then in 1992, the President Salinas, uh, and this was probably under the, in the context of uh, upcoming NAFTA, the negotiation of agreement with the, uh, with, with the US, and also the, membership, the entry of, uh, of the membership of Mexico to the OECD, wanted, wanted to attempt at completing the land reform and giving full property rights to the, to the redactarios. Okay. So this program called PROCEDE, which is a program of certification of land plots, and assignment of corporate shares for the common property rights to the Eridos member. The certificate for the, uh, for the individual plots, it means that uh, the, the owners now had f could freely use the land or not use it. If they didn't choose not to, they would not lose it for the matter. They could hire labor, they could rent out. So there was separation of ownership and land use. Now they had a completely choice on land use. They could also sell the certificate to other members of the communities uh, with assembly approval. They could not sell it outside. They had to before obtain a full uh, property right, full title, which is called Domino Pleno, and to get uh, to have unrestricted sale. And actually not many of them, very few of them have uh, requested that Domino Pleno still now. On the uh, CPR, on the forest and the, and, and the pasture, then the uh, decision, so the shares were given to, to all the eridos, but the decision was uh, in the hand of the community as a whole, the erido as a whole. So they could, decide, they could decide now to distribute the land if they choose to, to incorporate new eridatarios. They could decide the conversion from, of land use, which were not allowed before, before it was very restricted. And they could decide at the RIDO level um, to, how they wanted to, uh, to dispose of the land, except, of course, under the minimum restrictions that, that are in the forestry law in Mexico. 
The rollout of Procede took only 13 years. It was absolutely remarkable. It was fast. It was huge. It was orderly. I mean, this is sort of, I think, an example of a success. And I like to mention that every time we talk about Procede, we have to recognize the big success when they happen. Started in 93 with only a couple of uh, a couple of veridos. Uh, only in 99, a few years afterwards, you already have 17,000 eridos which are certified. And then by 2006, most of them are. It's 27,000 eridos. And then the, the, uh, the ref land reform, the procedure was closed because the, the remaining eridos that were not were either, uh, either indigenous community, which had more a difficult, uh, more difficult property right regimes to solve, or the riddles which were at very particular conflict. So essentially, in 13 years, 30, 27,000 riddles were, were certified. It was done with a lot of discipline, uh, resolution of the conflict, and as a group, so make sure that there was no abuse, and I think it has been uh, really a very success story. We're going to use that rollout. So this is our empirical strategy. We're going to use this rollout to analyze the impact of that, of the acquisition of these property rights to, on, the, on the eridos. So we're going to have panels of eridos, and we have a lot of observation, 27,000 panels of eridos, and match them with the uh, localities, which are next to the eridos, to, to look at the population changes match them with the electoral, electoral section for look, to look at the electoral result. And then we use the land use uh, maps that we have in Mexico for looking at the evolution of land use. And those are three different papers. Uh, now, the validation of the approach, we have took that pretty seriously, looking at parallel trends and also a lot of robustness check, but I'll dispense you of that. Okay, so in terms of the data, what we're going to use, and I'm sure you the result afterwards, we're, for, the, for the migration, we are going to use two types of data, either the PROGRESSA data, and this is a SMAP panel over three years. This is the first wave of the PROGRESSA data, 97 to 2000. So it's a, shmo, it's a, small, it's a small data set. It's only 7,600 households in only a small number of eridos, but it has the advantage that we have a lot of detail because we have a full household survey. At the other extreme, we're going to look at the population census. So that's covered the whole of Mexico, uh, looking at population census, but this is only two years, 90, which was before, and 2000, which is when we are about two thirds into the uh, project. Uh, Landsat data, which have been interpreted by the Ministry of Agriculture in, uh, in, uh, in Mexico. And then use also uh, the data from Procampo, so this is a subsidy program in Mexico, and Mexico takes uh, on, on, for the crop, for the crop a compensation for NAFTA. And Mexico uh, takes the transparency uh, very seriously, and you can find on the web the list of every single farmer who receive Procampo, uh, which is all the farmers in Mexico. And then you have, can have their name, I think, and they can have the area that they cultivate. So we can actually look at evolution of farm size based on that data. And fi finally, electoral result that we are going to use. So let me take those three uh, issues, the two issues at a time. Labor um, migration. So what we find here is that the certification led to, led to substantial out-migration. Now, the, in those rural areas, the background of migration is pretty high. Over the three years that we look at on progress of data, data 5.3% of the household had one additional migrant that left the that left the household and the village, and we see that with the uh, with, with the certification, 30, that migration out migration increased by 30 percent. That was in Progresa. If we look at the population uh, census data, we have also again a very large out migration out of these small localities, a background of 21 percent migration of decrease in population, so it's not micro, decrease in population of the, uh, between 90 and 2000. And we see an increase corresponding to the certification of 4% additional points. 
we find some heterogeneity in that migration, and which goes with the idea that a lot of the migration, uh, a lot of the returning of the population was due to the incomplete property right, that we see that there is more migration when there were uh, weak, weaker property rights before, that means uh, it has retained population more. We see also more migration, we had lower land quality and less migration when there's more quality and more migration when you have better off uh, wage opportunity outside. In terms of land use, that's the second, another uh, study that we did, what do we expect to happen? Well, we could have decreased because now you can finally leave your land idle without losing it. You can see no change if it's just there is a rental and sales market, or you can see an increase, which a lot of people would say, because you have security and functioning of land market. Now, using those Landsat data that we have over those three years, 93, 2002, 2007, we see in aggregate no change in cultivated land, area in agricultural, cultivated in agricultural product. What's really interesting is that we see actually an increase in cultivated land in the area with higher productivity as measured uh, at the level of the municipality, and then uh, a slight decrease in the area with lower productivity. So that suggests some efficiency gains of land use through land reallocation, land selection. And using the Procampo data, and actually also some of the Progressa data, we see some consolidation of land in larger farm. And we see that the household which have either, uh, which have better land or more land tend to migrate less. So there is also some suggestion of efficiency gains through the farmer selection, better farmer selection on larger, larger farm. The current work uh, is actually to, is very ambitious, is to reconstruct the land use data on an annual basis based on Landsat, Landsat images and uh, machine learning technique to interpret those land site, to, to interpret those uh, images. And so, but it's not, we have preliminary results, but I won't talk about that. Political consequences are on the, that we, we can observe. So, as I mentioned to you, it was President Salinas and then the PRI which initiated the reform. Who benefited politically from the reform? So, we looked at the election result, and every three years there is election for the Congress in Mexico. So, we have during this period, 94, 7, 2000, 2003. We match uh, the electoral section to the localities and to the heridos, and so we have 19,000 electoral section that we can observe over this. And what we're going to be looking at is that whether the electoral result that we see, the share that goes to a party, is influenced by the, the share of the population of that locality, which is associated with an heredo which received the title. Okay? So it's not, it's just, so it's, there's sort of two shares in that. There's a share of the population which is in heredos, but there's also the share which is uh, which, received it, which received the certification. Now let me interpret that uh, figure, and I think that's going to be the, the main result in that. So what we see here, what we have represented here, a very simplified way, the, the result that we have. So we have here the four elections, and then uh, we have a selective group of eridos in each of these, uh, in each of these bar. We always have the left one is those eridos which have been just certified before the election, and on the right, the erido which have been, uh, which are, will be certified immediately after. So it's sort of discontinuity here. And then we follow these. So now they are, they were certified before that second election, and those are the future. Those are going to be certified afterwards, and, and the same as here. Okay. So a couple of things to look at on that graph. First, there's a trending increase in the vote share for the. This is the vote share for the pan, which is the right. Uh, the party to the right, and not the pre which had given the, uh, the... So first we see an overall increase in the share to PAN, uh, which is the trend that happened during this period. You see that both looking at the overall trend across all the different groups, and you see also in each, uh, between each election, you see uh, on the group of Erido particularly. And so that's a large area. But what we see also, which is really interesting, is that the difference that we see at each uh, in each election between those who just got the property right and those who don't 
yet have, but are going to have them in the next two years. And you see, every time, every time, those who just got the property right vote a bit more, voted a bit more in favor of PAN, 1.2 1 to 2.9 percent, and that's an average 7 percent increase in, uh, in time. Okay, so um, so we see that I'm going to look, skip that, and I guess I have to conclude. But after Anna was saying. And there's an interesting discussion about whether that, let me just take a second to do that, whether that was an error or not. Uh, how come the pre gave those property rights and those, uh, and those retirees were so, had so little gratitude that did not even for the pre? Uh, one argument, which I think is a, is a very strong argument for, 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 for that, is that the, um, in fact, when you do a one-time transfer, there's no need to have gratitude. You need gratitude to government only when you have a recurrent transfer to make sure that it comes back. So actually, I think it uh, was to be expected in a way. OK, let me, this is my uh, concluding, um, concluding slide. The reform that we see uh, induced large out-migration of labor and population, concentration of agriculture, concentration of production in larger farms, so probably some efficiency gain due to both labor and land reallocation. It was at the same time a huge transfer in terms of wealth to the population. So it's likely some equity gains, although we didn't measure much. Okay, but it was politically costly. Also something we, we don't mention that here at all, but we have to be careful is that this large out-migration mean that we need, I mean, it's, it can only be uh, good if there is sufficiently I can create unemployment, it can only have positive effect if we have the capacity, the labor absorption capacity in the country for them. So it's not all rosy. Thank you. <laughs>